um, once again for just this opportunity to be together as your people uh, right here, Whipperwill Church. And God, I just pray your hand upon us this morning as we um, just yet look at another question in this series of questions on faith. And God, just encourage our hearts together today, we pray, and grow our faith, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I forgot one thing before coming up. Ooh. We're all good now, I think. <laughs> well, um, we are coming to yet another question in this whole series of, of faith. And maybe you never thought about this question before. Um, maybe you have. I hope that you have. But we're looking at this question today of, how can I grow my faith, or how can my faith grow? Um, you know, but go all the way back to Mother's Day earlier this year, and and I went out to this uh, that nursery out on Old Thirty One. I don't remember the name of it, but boy, they has a lot of beautiful plants. I went there to get um, some flowers for Sue, and I came back with some flowers. And guess what else? Vegetables. <laughs> came back with some pepper plants, and I came back with. Um, zucchini plant and it's like but we really didn't have a place to grow them <laughs> but I just said hey you just can't turn down a good looking plant can you when you when you're at a nursery like that so I brought those home and planted the, the peppers and they're getting about four hours of sunlight a day <laughs> planted the zucchini and it was getting about four hours of sunlight and they weren't looking so good, and the peppers, like, well, but I, you know, whatever happens to them is, is okay. This zucchini I wanted to keep hold of, and so I, I planted it in one place in our landscaping. <laughs> then I moved it to another place in our landscaping, and I thought, you know what, still not getting enough sun. So then I put it in a potted, or a, a yeah, a garden pot, and Sue just uh, looked at me here, what, a couple weeks ago, and looked at that zucchini, and she said, you know they get pretty big, right? <laughs> so we're going to see how that zucchini grows. If I get a zucchini off that, I'll bring it to church, and it'll be an offering unto God. <laughs> well, growing vegetables is something that we've probably all um, had a part of before. But what about this question, growing our faith? What about that? Growing our faith, it's, a, it's an important question, and we need to be reminded of, but, but growing your faith, growing in your faith, it's, it's really important. We are Christians who ought to be growing in our faith every day. And so we're going to look at that here this morning, it's growing in our faith. And I want to bring this foundational principle to you. When we talk about our faith, I'm going to get it out there right away, and here's the principle, Okay. Faith is like a muscle. It only grows if you exercise it. Right. Now, very interestingly, if you go into the New Testament and you come across this uh, story, it's a very interesting story in Luke. And the disciples were on a boat in the middle of the Sea of Galilee and things were not going so well. This huge storm came up. And let's just jump right into that story. A windstorm came down on the lake and they were filling with water. That is, the boat was filling with water, and they were in danger. And they went and woke him, speaking of Jesus, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and raging waves, and they ceased, and there was a calm. And we don't have the picture available to us today that the disciples face. Could you imagine that? Rather than the, the rough waves there in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, Waves are coming over into the boat. The boat is beginning to fill with water. And you're thinking, oh my goodness. <laughs> Jesus was always about teaching. Always about teaching. And this was something, I believe, that was on purpose. Jesus had them right out in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. And he wanted them to grow their faith. But look at this question. He said to them, where is your faith? Where is your faith? And they were afraid, and they marveled, saying to one another, Who then is this that he commands even winds and water? And they obey him. That would have been a, a crazy thing to be a part of, wouldn't it? 
awesome thing, this is a tremendous miracle. But did you notice that, that question, where's your faith, Jesus said. This was a teaching moment for them. He wanted them to grow their faith. Now, the disciples had been with Jesus, and they were uh, traveling with Jesus from town to town. And Jesus used this storm to grow their faith. So that question comes, are you growing your faith? Now, before we go on, any of you ever been in a cast before? Have you? I've been in, what, three different casts before? <laughs> the biggest one was from my hip all the way down to my ankle. They had to order an extra large size, extra long, tall. <laughs> but that happened when I was in college, wrestling around with my, my roommate. My kneecap went from here to here, to the side of my leg, and it's like, whoa. So I had a cast from my hip all the way down my ankle. I had a cast on my wrist, uh, playing basketball. I had a cast on my ankle, playing basketball. So I, I know what happens um, when you put your arm or your ankle or your leg in a cast and you leave it there for six weeks and then you take that cast off and then you look at your arm. The one arm without a cast, the one arm with a cast. You know what the difference is, right? The one arm shriveled up. <laughs> if you are not intentional about growing your faith, guess what's going to happen to your faith? It's going to begin to shrivel up. So we need to be reminded that, yes, this, this question is important. How can I grow my faith or how can my faith grow? The importance of faith. Let me just remind you, without faith, we cannot please God. Does that remind you of a verse in the Bible? Hebrews eleven six. 6, without faith, it's impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So faith is really important when it comes to this thing of Christianity, right? And following Jesus. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Faith also brings us assurance. There in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is what? The assurance of things hoped for. That's so essential. Faith is so important to our faith, our, for our Christian life. The third thing we find out about faith is faith builds our conviction. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Conviction is standing upon something, no matter what the world looks like around you. Conviction is being so sure of a truth that you're willing to lay it all down for that truth. So conviction it's, it's, it leads to conviction. Faith also moves us to action. Do you know that? Hebrews chapter 11 is feel, filled with the heroes of faith. I'm just going to point out three of them to you here this morning. But all through Hebrews chapter 11, you see all these heroes of the faith mentioned by the author of Hebrews because he's helping us to understand that that faith is a big thing. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. Wow. Do you know when Noah got that word from God about rain coming? They had never had rain before. Never before. And so here we have Noah stepping out in faith, not just believing something, but acting upon it. And he spent, we're told, even years and years and years building that big ark. Then you go on, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out in a place that he was not, or that he, oh, sorry, that he was to, uh, boy, my eyes are playing tricks on me. That's what happened when you get older, isn't it? <laughs> by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. Let that sink in for a moment. God called Abraham to a land that he knew not. Abraham, I want you to go to the promised land. Okay, where is it? Um, I'll tell you <laughs> in a little while. Well, where is it? Abraham going to Sarah. Honey, pack your bags. We're leaving. Where are we going? I don't know. <laughs> Can you imagine being in that situation? So Abraham went and followed God, not knowing exactly where he was going to be going. 
So he went out uh, not knowing where he was going. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and that they were not afraid of the king's edict. You see, the king's edict in Egypt was to kill all the baby boys, the Jewish baby boys. So, so imagine that as parents, you're willing to hide your baby, keep him away from the Pharaoh, and they acted upon their faith. But all through Hebrews chapter 11, you see faith is an action. It is an action word. So that's why we see this passage in James. What good is it, my brother, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you say to them, go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So faith is an action. We need to be reminded of that. Okay, how can we grow our faith? Seven ways. How can my faith grow? Seven ways. By faith, you'll grow through learning God's word. Do you know that? By faith, you will grow through learning God's word. Romans 10 tells us, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So as we listen to God's word, as we study God's word, guess what? Our faith grows. I love this passage, don't you? Psalm chapter 1. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither. And all that he does, he prospers. Let's go back up to the top of that, though. This person who is a godly person, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. I mentioned this earlier in the service today. That's a good picture of meditating upon God's word. The cow chewing the cud. <laughs> you know, cows, they'll, maybe you don't know this, but cows, they'll, They'll eat a clump of hay, and then they'll swallow it. And then, then guess what? Then they'll unswallow it. And then they chew it on some more. A cow is a good picture. There's this whole thing of meditating upon God's word. You get up in the morning, you read God's word, then you think about it again and again throughout the day. You meditate upon it. And that's what we need to be reminded of. If you want to grow your faith... Get into God's word and meditate it. My faith will also grow through obedience. My faith will also grow through obedience. And we need to be reminded of this as well. Um, just a, a good uh, reminder. Here's the passage. Jesus shared this teaching. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded upon the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat against the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Obedience is so important in our faith. We need to obey God, read his word, get into his word, and obey his word. By the way, you may have heard this story before, a story about a farmer who wanted to sell his mule. Well, he put an ad in um, the paper, a local paper, and one day a man from another community came to the farm. He was interested in the mule. The two farmers got to talking and eventually they got around to talking about the mule. The farmer who wanted to buy the mule asked if the mule was a good worker. The reply was, the mule did a day's work. The next question was this, did the mule obey every command? The owner said, yes. The farmer asked if they could hitch the mule up to see how it worked. The other said, no problem. Got the mule hitched up, a harness on him, and the farmer took the reins and told the mule, giddy up. The mule just stood there. <laughs> Gave him another command. The mule, mule just stood there. The farmer tried a couple more times, and still the mule did not move. 
Well, then the farmer said to the one selling the mule, I thought you told me he obeys. He does, the owner said. Then he picked up a two by four, walked over the mule, hit him across the head, and then he gave him the command. Guess what? The mule then obeyed. <laughs> You know, sometimes we are like the mule, aren't we? Sometimes we are slow to obey God. And sometimes God allows a two-by-four to hit us on the head (laughs) to wake us up. But obedience is so important in this whole thing of growing to faith. My faith will also grow through God-orchestrated relationships. From one man, he made all nations that they should inhabit the whole earth, Paul tells us in the book of Acts. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. Did you catch all that? God, in his orchestration, put you right here in Rochester, Indiana, for such a time as this. Think about all the possibilities. You could have lived in another time. You could have lived in another place. But God has you right here at this moment for a purpose. And when you begin to ask your questions like, God, why am I living where I'm living? Why have you put me against, or have me living right against this neighbor? God, why, why have you sent me to this store at this time to this clerk that's checking me out? When you begin to understand that and you begin to ask the question, your faith will begin to grow and grow and grow. By the way, I got to tell you this story. It just happened yesterday. I was here at the church, and I wanted to just go ahead and email my sermons home so I could uh, go over them again at home. So it's like about, I don't know, five o'clock or so, six o'clock. Emailed those uh, sermons home. I got home, and I realized that I didn't email one of the sermons. I thought I did, but I didn't. So one sermon went home. That was for this morning here at the church, the blueberry sermon never got sent. I was like, oh. So I had to come back to church a second time. Driving up the hill, getting ready to go in the entrance, I look over, there's a young man sitting on the marquee outside. No shoes, shorts and a t-shirt, quite a battered t-shirt at that. And so it's like, okay. <laughs> Asked, asked the young man, I said, um, everything okay? He said, actually not, I'm lost. I said, you're lost, okay. <laughs> yeah, we were floating down the river and I got in an argument with my girlfriend. My girlfriend took off and left me. It's like, okay. I said, was your girlfriend worth it? <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I did say that to him though, he just smiled. <laughs> And then he said, I have no idea where I'm at. It's like, really? He said, where do you live? Aura. Can I have a ride? Sure. Let me call my wife. Sue, pray. <laughs> no. I just told her what had happened. We're going to take him home. And so we're in this conversation on the way home. He said he was um, an addict along with his girlfriend, addicted to meth, been in jail two times. And sitting there in the car and saying, okay, God, watch over me. <laughs> but it was a good conversation. I asked him, if he ever come to place his faith in Christ? And he said he had. And we had some more spiritual discussions. I prayed with him after pulling into his driveway. And I just prayed that God would have a work in his heart. But think about that. Think about the what ifs. What if... I sent both sermons home like I was supposed to. (laughs) What if he wasn't there when I came back to the church at that time and he was maybe walking in another road somewhere? All those what ifs. That's one of the things I've impressed upon him as well. I said, you know what? (laughs) His name was Joseph. I said, Joseph, our meeting today is a God thing. It's a God thing. And so he was so grateful for the ride home, grateful for praying with him. And I'm telling you, God orchestrated relationships are another way that God grows your faith. Be watching for him. My faith will grow through stepping out of my comfort zone. 
How many of you like to step out of your comfort zone? No, not, not many, right? Jesus purposely made the disciples step out of their comfort zone, and they were on the lake once again. They sailed to the country of Gerasenes, which is opposite of Galilee. That's on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. Every Jewish person knew that the other side of Galilee was not a good place. In fact, it was called, you ready for this? The home of Satan. That's what they knew. They knew that. Jesus was taking them across the Sea of Galilee to the east side, to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. And couldn't you imagine the disciples thinking, there's nothing good that's going to happen out of this. <laughs> We're going to Satan's home. Well, here's the rest of the story. Then Jesus had stepped out of the boat on the land. There met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time he had worn clothes and he had not lived in a house, but among the tombs, when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. Now picture yourself in the disciples' sandals, okay? What was that like? That was a scary thing. Oh my goodness. It's a terribly scary thing. He had commanded them, clean spirit, to come out of the man for many a time. It had seized him. It kept him under the guard and bound with chains and shackles. But he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Jesus then asked him, what is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. And they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. And they begged him to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. The demons came out of the man, entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. Wow. What would that have been like to be a part of that experience? It's crazy to think of, right? Then the people went out to see what had happened. That's just a repeat, sorry. And they were so afraid. I'm going to share this experience with you. When you go to seminary and you study to be a pastor, one of the classes you have to take is, is basically preaching. And so there's a whole different um, aspect of preaching in front of students, fellow students, and then actually preaching your first sermon. My first sermon was in a nursing home. That scared the daylights out of me. <laughs> it did. And you know, you go to a nursing home and and I've preached in a nursing home more than once, many times, actually. Um, and sometimes they aren't so good at listening. <laughs> I still remember one lady, she's like, speak up, I can't hear you. <laughs> it's a frightening thing to, to be preaching for the first time and then preaching in a nursing home on top of that. It's like, I was out of my comfort zone in a big way. But you know what? God used that experience to grow my faith. <laughs> my faith can grow through pain and suffering. God uses pain and suffering to grow our faith. James says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow, so let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. We need to be reminded that God does use suffering and pain in our lives to grow our faith. By the way, I don't know if you heard, but, um, Brian and Hope Eber went to a concert back in June, first part of June, um, King and Country. They were up in South Bend. They went to the concert, just said that was the best concert ever. It's a Christian country group. And they were just so encouraged by it. Later that night, they heard the bad news that went out. A couple that attended the concert as they were going home, just less than a half mile from their home, came to an intersection, and someone ran through the intersection and hit them. The wife died. Three weeks later, the husband died. And they left behind two daughters, a 17-year-old and a 20-year-old. I'm thinking, oh. What's it going to be like for them? I mean, they're, they're in this stage of life where they, they needed the support of their mom and dad. And it's like, oh my goodness. I'm telling you, God can use pain and suffering in a way that will grow our faith. Faith is something 
that we need to be growing in our lives. My faith can grow through dealing with sin. We need to be reminded of this. David, Psalm 51, the context is that Nathan the prophet just came to David and exposed his sin with Bathsheba. David's broken. And he writes these words, Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter in the snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. You know, David covered up that sin for a whole year. Or almost a year. And then a baby came along as a result of David and Bathsheba's union. So David tried to cover it up, just cover it up and not think about it. That was the reason God rose up Nathan the prophet and said, go to my servant David and expose his sin. Hmm. When we confess our sin, our faith grows. We need to confess our sin daily. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew my right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. First John says what? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God desires us to, to be confessing our sins before him. And I'm telling you, when you cover your sin, when you hold your sin at bay and don't deal with it, your faith is going to shrivel. One final thing. My faith can grow th- through being still and simply listening to God. We live in a rat race, don't we? <laughs> we go to and fro and to and fro. And so many times we don't take the time to be still and just listen. John 10, verses 2 and 3 But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Who's the shepherd of the sheep? Jesus. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Are you listening to his voice? Are you listening to the voice of God? Be still, the psalmist said, and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations and I will be exalted in the earth. God wants us to not live a rat race of a life. He wants us to be still and listen. Listen to his voice. We're going to close out this message with actually a video that my brother-in-law sent me. Great, great message that follows through on this whole thing and being still. So Kevin, go ahead and start the video.